I V M. Before you listen to this episode of the Seen and the Unseen, I have a recommendation for you. Do check out Pulya Bazi, hosted by Saurabh Chandra and Pranay Kotesane, two really good friends of mine. Kickass podcast in Hindi. It's amazing. What does it mean to be Indian? India as a nation state has existed for just over 70 years and that's a blip in time. Our culture, our civilization as we call it has existed much longer than that and humans for even longer than that. It seems short-sighted to make that nation state the focus of our identity and it's equally short-sighted in fact to base our identity on any other circumstance of our birth like our ethnicity or religion or caste. Those also haven't been around for too long and are far more fluid then we realize if you think of your identity as an atomized individual who is a product of chance and circumstance that's part of the truth right there but if you see yourself also as connected to the past a small part of something much bigger and older than yourself then you need to go a little further back than 70 years or a few hundred years or even a few thousand years you need to read tony joseph's book early indians Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen. I've spoken to historians on the show before and chatted about history, but the furthest back I've gone is a few hundred years. My guest today, the author Tony Joseph, will take us back tens of thousands of years. Early Indians is a book that answers many important questions about our species, particularly our species in India. Where did humans come from? When did they get to India? Who are the original Indians if such a term applies? Who were the Harappans? Who were the Aryans? Whose descendants are we? Are North Indians and South Indians different from each other in some fundamental way? Are tribals lesser than our city dwellers? Some of these are questions of politics, but all of them can be answered only by science. And in the last few years, literally in this decade, there have been radical advances in a number of sciences that now answer these contentious questions. And Tony's remarkable book reveals all. As does this episode, so keep listening. I'll begin my conversation with Tony after a quick commercial break. Like me, are you someone who loves fine art but can't really afford to have paintings by the artists you like hanging on your walls? Well, worry no more. Head on over to indiancolors.com. Indian Colors is a company that licenses images of the finest modern art from some of the best artists in India and adapts them into objects of everyday use. These include wearable art like stoles and shrugs, home decor like cushion covers and table runners, and accessories like tote bags. This allows art lovers to actually get fine art into their homes at an accessible price, and artists get royalties on sales just like authors do. What's more, Indian Colors now has an exciting range of new products including fridge magnets with some stunning motifs and salad bowls and platters made of mango wood. Their artists include luminaries like Babu Xavier, Vasvo Xvasvo, Brinda Miller, Dilip Sharma, Shruti Nelson and Pradeep Mishra. They accept bulk orders for corporate and festival gifting, but even if you want to buy just for yourself or a friend, head on over to indiancolors.com. That's colors with an O U. And if you want a 20% discount apply the code IVM20. That's I V M for IVM podcast. I V M20 for a 20% discount at indiancolors.com. Tony, welcome to the scene in the NC. Thank you very much Amit. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Tony, two very close friends of mine whom I both adore and admire and almost revere, uh, Devanshu Datta and Nilanjana Roy, uh, have mentioned to me that you gave them their first job. and that makes you for me an almost mythical figure like you are an early indian in my eyes <laughs> so, tell me a little bit about your career i'm really glad that i did so and uh, i was glad then that i did so and i'm glad that looking back that we worked together and that was uh, a time when i was in uh, business standard with the brief to start a feature section a day that's about uh, you know a pull out full section and that involved uh, every day of the week and build the team that will pull it off so we had things ranging from smart investor on stock markets to the strategist on management this is early to mid 90s this would be 80 yeah that's right mm. and you had to find people for that to staff this and you needed people who were really really bright because you needed to go into new areas that had not been covered in the and you can't get the talent from existing newspapers because many they had not been looking at these areas in the way that we intended to look at these areas and cover them 
So we might as well use this opportunity to break, bring in new talent into journalism. And it was absolutely amazing experience. I think the people that I worked with in Business Standard and later on in Business World also. And uh, those were really outstanding teams and a pleasure to work with. When did you actually start as a journalist? Like what brought you into journalism? There's like, uh, you know, when I was growing up in the 80s, uh, yeah. the common view about journalists is that they failed at everything else. Yeah. Engineer, nahi bane, doctor, nahi bane, chalo, journalism. Yeah. What brought you into journalism? Journalism has always been, uh, what shall I say, an attraction for me. Because I think the idea of engaging with public ideas or public mind has been exciting. So the place that I joined us for first was a newspaper called News Time. It was a newspaper that was begun for the first time by the Inadu group in Hyderabad. Uh, which year? This would be 1983. Right. I would have been all of 21 years old. Right. So I started as a trainee with a stipend of 600 rupees a month. And it was fascinating that it was a completely new paper. Then that would become a late motive for all of the rest of my career because I would have always worked with one year exception. I always worked in places which were either starting up or we are already there, but we are going through a complete rejuvenation or a complete revamp of some kind. And that's when you actually learn the inards of a process or a profession or of a system because you can see things being put together or being pulled apart. If you always work in places that are completely settled, your pace of learning is much, much lower. So, yeah, I started at News Time in Hyderabad. Then I was with India Today in, uh, in Delhi for a year. Then I joined uh, Economic Times where I was featured when I left in 1991. Then I was with Business Standard from 1991 till 1998, I think. And then I was with Business World as editor for about eight years in all, though with a break in between. So, you know, a young journalist starting out today has the advantage of the internet. He can read the best journalism in the world. He can see back issues of the New Yorker, the New York Times, whatever. But back then when you're starting out in the 80s, who were sort of your journalistic models and how did your ideas of best practices and what benchmarks to aim for uh, evolve over time? Like who were your early heroes, for example, and how did that change? When I joined India Today at that point of time in uh, 1987, I mean, at that point of time, that is the most highly valued, it's, it's the most important in India for uh, sure. A news, yeah. news magazine at that point of time and had made a large impact and a very good team. And I was starting out as a copy editor on their team and it was a very good place to be to learn from the rest of the team as well. When you were in economic times, you, again, that was a period when you are starting out, when you were learning to change this place from inside out because you're starting your features pages in a newspaper that had never, forget about features, they had never even knew, uh, worked on an anchor uh, news or anything other than just essentially plain vanilla news stories that are that the government, mostly come out of government announcements. So working with staff who had been in that kind of an environment with the same staff, and to try and bring out completely new, those were learning. So I think these were periods when you are learning from your peers, your bosses, and what you're doing yourself. All that changed when I was in Business Standard, when you're starting those sections. Because that's when you realize that each of those sections, when you went into, you did not have models which uh, you could pick from anywhere in, in the country because nobody was doing anything of that quality that you could say, I want to beat that or I want to. You perforce had to look at the best models in the world and then look at what trade-offs did they make that you don't want to make and what different kind of trade-offs do you want to make for the audience and the market that you are in. So if you're looking at stock markets, for example, you will look at Barron's, you would look at many other publications. Like if you're looking at building the, uh, the Strategist, the Harvard Business Review and the McKinsey Quarterly. So there are a whole range and the management books that are globally well accepted so in each of those areas that we got into, uh, this was when it became clear or for the really clear that your benchmarks have got to be global. And since then, it has been like that to answer. Since I have been in multiple areas all the time, I would stay with the smart investor for about six months, start the team, and then move on to starting the next section, which is the strategist, which is management, again, build the team and then move on. So what you were considering as your competition or model to beat depends on which areas that you were in. And when did you move on from journalism? 
you know, the entrepreneurship bug bit me at some point of time. And I was looking at for a way of building something that is related to media. And in around 2001, we did start a company. I co-founded a company with two, three others, which would work with media companies abroad to create, edit and design their products. But I mean, things didn't work out exactly the way that we planned because the market collapsed. Media, print media, especially in the West, went through the kind of radical destruction of value that we have rarely seen in any industry. So they themselves removed most of their editing staff. In uh, So many of the work that we were planning to get became, our assumptions became untenable. So that's, uh, but you could say this was an entrepreneurial break or a period, but it was still related to media and uh, not outside of it. And sort of coming to your book now, uh, kind of early Indians, how did you start getting interested in this subject? I have always been interested. It's not that I had a greater interest in history per se, but prehistory for some odd reason, which I still can't fully understand. The Harappan civilization, for example, has always had a great hold on me and uh, ever since I came across it. And these were also things that, because this is not about chronology, who did what, because the very fact that you cannot know the names of the people in prehistory because there are no documents or the places. I mean, the definition of prehistory is before writing uh, starts. Yes. starts yeah. And therefore, you are dealing with actual issues. Because to me, what is frustrating in history is that there are too many people and too many uh, Narratives. Uh, specific uh, issues and specific concerns. And in prehistory, when you don't have any of those things, you are dealing with pure issues. It's not talking about perspectives. It's about what really happened here. So some of the questions that were on my mind, which has always been the case, is who were the Harappans? Where did they come from? Where did they go? And uh, why did it take more than a thousand years? Imagine this, more than a thousand years for cities and urbanism itself to rise up again in the subcontinent. It strikes you, if you haven't been to Dholavira in Gujarat, please go one day. It's, it's one of the major Harappan centers, the most uh, distinctive Harappan city in India today. And uh, it's a stunning sight. You know, most of the superstructure has already been destroyed. So you can only see the the substructure, the foundations. But even seeing that, you can see the robustness with which these places were built. The, and you should see the scale of the ambition. You know, there's a large uh, stadium with stands for people. And you can imagine what could have been going on there. Just that scale of ambition and the sturdiness with which things are built, the huge reservoirs that are built. And uh, then you realize that this was would have been around 2600 BCE. Yeah, yeah. And you have to wait till the Mauryans arrive, you know, nearly 1500 years later to see structures of that scale, ambition again. So these were questions that did not have good answers to. They were suppositions. So around six years ago, I decided that it would make sense to try and look at the Harappan questions in detail and see where we are compared to where we were then and what all the relevant disciplines today, based on current research, has to say on the equation. I thought I would be able to write a big story or a, big, a cover story somewhere on, on the Harappans. And I started going to all these sites, Tholavira, Lothal in Gujarat, Rakhi Gadi in uh, How Haryana. did it feel to see all these places? Because to someone who's not aware of the context or the history, it'll just be ancient ruins or whatever. Yeah. But you are actually going there with a sense of what it was and what the ambition behind it was and how old it all is. That's right. And how was the experience? Oh, it's absolutely stunning. And uh, the visit to Tholavira, I would say, of all the places, I have visited a lot of places. I have been to other prehistoric places in India, which are not related to uh, the Harappan civilization, but that happened later. But the visit to Tholavira was really moving because uh, at that point of time, it was not yet, when I visited, it was not yet fully clear. Are these people our ancestors or did they people who came from somewhere and disappeared? Now, we know, of course, that they are. To stand there and see the work that had been done and the streets that had been laid out, because you can see the streets, right? And when you can see the streets, you can almost see, even though they are not there, you can almost see the people walking down there. It, visually, it, it projects itself onto your mind. So it was a very, very moving experience. Lothal is a port city. 
and yeah it also is it's as much smaller than dholavira but but a standing one rakikadi there is nothing much to see because whatever has been excavated they haven't they filled it up again and to preserve it i think but there is nothing much to see but it is still uh, interesting to go there and imagine that this place there used to be a thriving civilization the best of its time and the interesting thing is you said that you sort of got interested in this again about you know 6 7 years ago yeah. and that's around the time that the science was also evolving at a, a rapid pace in fact if i may quote from your book quote just to get a sense of the speed at which things have moved consider this when work on this book began 6 years ago we did not know who were the people of the harappan civilization or where their descendants had gone but now we do Six years ago, we did not know how much of our ancestry we owed to the original out of Africa migrants who reached India about sixty-five thousand years ago. But now we do. Six years ago, we did not know when the caste system began. But now we can zero in on the period with a fair degree of genetic accuracy. These are just a few examples that demonstrate our rapidly improving understanding of prehistory, and not just with regard to India. Stop quote. And and what you go on to describe in the pages of your book, and I'd urge all the listeners to read it for themselves. But what you go on to describe is a, a sort of a revolution in the science not just in like one field of it but you you have looked at like six or seven different disciplines here to kind of come to the conclusions uh, but that you've come to in which is now the new evolved understanding of what exactly happened and i had absolutely no idea all of this has happened till i read your book to be honest so tell me a little bit about what has happened in the science yeah when i started on this 6 years ago I wasn't aware of the revolution that is happening with population genetics. I wasn't. I was barely conscious of the fact that there is something called population genetics that might be relevant to the area that you're looking at. I was going through sites. I was talking to archaeologists who had excavated them. I was talking to historians. I was talking to epigraphists who had looked at the script. I was talking to philologists who might have something to say about what the old texts have to say about these things. So I was going through all the traditional disciplines. which they themselves had progressed during the last few decades that one had not been following it so it was quite interesting to see how far we had come and so it's only about 2 3 years into the research that you start understanding that hey a lot of new interesting information is coming from a new field that you had not been focused on which is called population genetics and they were using understanding of the genome of present day populations mostly initially to work out affinities between different population groups and that is absolutely interesting to the question of who were the harappans so then i started reading in the papers and getting in touch with the world's leading experts in india and outside and uh, discussing with them their work and what they were finding and how it has been changing and during this process what you realized also is that population genetics is, is itself is a science that is proceeding at a very fast rate it's progressing it is introducing new ways of analyzing and the cost of doing it almost seems analysis. like uh, it's not incremental it's exponential that's it's how exponential. it felt to me i think yeah. all disciplines go through that at some point of time right, right? early on maybe automotive technology does mm. that then it stabilizes or that mm. i think all disciplines in their life as a period when it is ramping up very rapidly in terms of its understanding and, and tools that it uses so population genetics went through that phase in the last 4 or 5 years so and uh, then in the last 2 3 years what has happened is that they started using ancient dna that is dna from people who lived thousands or tens of thousands of years ago and then the whole game changed because now you can not only understand affinities between populations now you can answer the question who moved where and when and that is dramatic right because that that answers the most basic questions about prehistory of people movements that formed populations and these have answered questions not just in south asia they have answered questions of population formation in europe in uh, in the americas in australia in in every part of the world so india is just one part of the new understanding of prehistory and how populations formed across the world to finish it it just happened to be looking at these issues when a new sense happened to be there providing the answers so it was serendipitous you could say in that way 
very fortuitous and you know you've got a very complicated and nuanced discussion in your pages of population genetics and uh, i'll just urge everyone to read it can't possibly be summed up i i took those pages very slow to kind of make sure i could uh, understand all of that but mota mota the basic thing is that if you are for example trying to now go back in history and tell all those grand stories like you said uh, you know without perspective just what happened where did we come from where did we move what were the patterns of migration all of that can be told through genetics because through each generation you have those imprints coming down and you can go back in history and figure out um, all of that exactly is that a correct summation yes because of mutations that happen over time and right. mutations are carried on through successive generations not everybody has the same mutations you can't find affinities between people who carry the same kind of genetic fingerprints or or marks or mutations that's one way of uh, i think really, you know my book explains it in much more detail that's one way of describing how it is possible to look at different populations and see genetically without uh, anything else with just their genomes to see who which populations are related to which populations and to what extent for example we now know that all populations outside of africa came from a small subset of the african population that moved out of africa around 70000 years ago this is a genetic discovery the genetic discovery based on the huge understanding of the genetic diversity of existing human population around the world in africa and outside of it and we know that all of the people outside of africa come from a very small subset and these are all generically called out of africa migrations uh, that mm-hmm. first one migration out of which people went out mm-hmm. to populate all of the rest it's of called, the world is called the out of africa migration yeah and and this happened around 70000 bce and then you talk about how around 65000 bce or 60000 bce yeah. you have india being inhabited by what you by these migrants from africa correct uh, whom you describe as the first indians correct so tell me a little bit more about um, you know how we get this kind of uh, knowledge and what are the kind of patterns of migration across the world during this time from out of africa the out of africa migration now we have now, now you need to use uh, archaeology and other other disciplines also to arrive at rough dating of how people went to arrived at different continents for example we know that the earliest modern humans or homo sapiens to reach the americas i mean those were that was the last major continent to be occupied by modern humans was only about 16000 years ago we know that uh, australia and this is by archaeological evidence we know that australia was occupied by modern humans at least by around 59000 years ago and that southeast asia was occupied by modern humans at least by around 63000 years ago so if you know that the first out of africa migration happened around 70000 years ago using genetics and some amount of climatic possibilities at that point of time and you know that they reached australia around 59000 years ago then it is reasonable to assume that they were in india by around 65000 years ago i think the people who moved on from india went across to southeast asia east asia japan india uh, sorry china and they also went across to uh, australia and uh, the best understanding is that there is one stream of out of africa migrants who went up what is today pakistan into central asia and then west and they might have an another group that went even across west asia into europe we know that the earliest signs of modern humans in europe is around 45000 years ago or so so that's the very rough sketch of the peopling of the world you can i mean yeah yeah and the other interesting thing is that we weren't the i mean those out of africa migrants weren't the first humans here that you know i mean we we are all of course homo sapiens which are the only surviving human species left but yeah. there were various other human species across the world and yeah. what i kind of found fascinating was where you mentioned that uh homo sapiens in africa if you look at the evidence they did not really intermingle with other humans but everywhere else they went they uh, intermingled for example to quote again from your book a uh, quote uh, all non african homo sapiens today carry about 2% neanderthal genes in their dna some of us like the melanesians papuans and aboriginal australians also carry 3 to 6% denisovan dna because of the genetic inheritance we may call them our ancestors but it is perhaps more reasonable to see them as our evolutionary cousins with whom homo sapiens did 
Delhi, uh, Stropcourt. And um, it only means that Neanderthals were present in Europe right. and Denisovans were present in Central Asia and those regions. And we partied with them. And we partied with them. But uh, it doesn't mean that they, if Neanderthals were not in Africa, they couldn't have mixed with Neanderthals. Exactly. But there were many more species of Homo species in Africa than in outside of Africa. Ah. So it is a given that they would have mixed. In fact, the beginning of the modern human himself would have been as a result of multiple mixtures between different species of the Homo species. So it is just that in Africa, you did not see evidence of mixing with Neanderthals or, or Denisovans because they were probably not in Africa. They were in, in those regions. And the out-of-Africa migrants came across them when they immigrated out of Africa and they did mix with them, must have mixed with them pretty early for all of us to have around 2% Neanderthal ancestry. Marvelous. And through all these years, like before we sort of come to modern times of 7000 BC, which is going to be our next stop, but before we come there through all this time, how were these human migrations and the, the evolution and the dominance of Homo sapiens affected by things like geography and geology and weather? Very, very significantly. I think since when we talk about prehistory, we are talking about such large uh, spans, of, spans time. of time. And we are usually used to speaking about, uh, you know, decades or centuries, etc. In which case, you know, climates and these don't change all that much. So this is a radical shift that takes place when you are discussing prehistory that you have to, because that's a predominant formation of and affects human behavior. Uh, for example, when many of the population movements, where, how do how do humans or or even animals or mammals move from one place to another? W what is it that drives it? One of the things that drives it is uh, cli you know dramatic climate changes during the glacial ages. Uh, since almost all of the water is locked up in ice sheets, there's very little evaporation, much less evaporation happening, and so glacial ages are very arid. So quite apart from the fact that a lot of the world will be covered in ice sheets, even other parts that are not covered in ice sheets, there's a very great aridity. So places that would have been earlier luxurious and thriving with life and greenery would go back to being deserts. So, and when warms up again, then you see there are new lush pastures where there were deserts earlier. And you would then see animals and, you know, moving in there because there's a new territory for them. And when animals or our cattle move in, you can also see their predators and humans and everybody moves in. That, that's what makes the, uh, one of the earliest historic movements of people or even the out-of-Africa migrations would have been shaped by these changes in climates in various ways. Even when, and sometimes it may not be in ways that we imagine, it might be in counterintuitive ways also, because if there is greater aridity, it may mean they have to move to new areas when in, in search of uh, food. So, so this has to be taken into account when any specific question of, of the period, of the prehistoric period is being taken into account. And my book talks about how around 35,000 years ago in the Indian subcontinent, why there is evidence that there is something dramatic happened. The climate deteriorated. Modern humans started using because they were in competition with the previous uh, would have been for, for the same kind of remaining refuges that are there, that are usable for homo species. We can see them using, relying more and more on advanced weaponry such as microlithic tools, which are usually associated with modern humans and not with... Uh, but 35,000 BC they were using, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> microlithic tools, which can be used for spears, arrows, blades, and things like that. Um, and you can see genetic evidence says that their population increased actually during that period. So you can see where climate deteriorating, conflicts arising, modern humans using, relying more on new technology that they have introduced, and they're succeeding widely, and their population expanding. During a period, by 20,000 BCE, scientists say that uh, it's likely that South Asia uh, and the Indian subcontinent was the center of modern human population. So next time somebody says, you know, we, we are the largest population or one of the largest centers, it's nothing new. We have always been one of the largest centers or if not the, the center of modern human populations. And it, in fact, that might apply to earlier homo species too. This region has been 
very very good for the homo species this is indeed where the party is we'll take a quick commercial break which in terms of geological time will get over very fast Hello everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you aren't following us on social media, please make sure that you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just a couple of notes up front. One is that we are still running our listener survey. That's ivmpodcast.com slash survey. The survey is only going to run till the end of the week. So if you want a chance to win that awesome mug that we're giving out, please make sure that you fill out that survey. Also, I wanted to put out a quick reminder that if you're enjoying what you're listening to, please take a screenshot of what you're listening to, tag us on Instagram, and we'll put that in our story so that everybody else Can see what you're listening to. Also, please don't forget to put in a comment. On Cyrus says, Cyrus is joined by lawyer Ambar Rana, who talks about his family's army background, how jingoism is detrimental to patriotism, the noteworthy cases in his law practice, and how he addresses them on his podcast, Know Your Kanu. That's on the IVM Network. On episode two of our new foreign policy show, States of Anarchy, Hamsani talks to Dave Salvo and Brett Schaefer about Russian hacking in the U.S. elections. On how to citizen Meghnad and Shreyas are joined by comedian and satirist Ashish Shakya to discuss Chapter Nine on public facilities. On the Sponge Podcast, Ambi explains why it is consequential to set expectations on a realistic level and then slowly elevate them. On Shunya One, founder of Ayopo, Chirag Kriplani joins Sheila Ditya to talk about the growing Indonesian tech startup culture. On Garatantra, Swadhu and Alok are joined by expert Venkat Anand to discuss the influence of social media in the coming elections and how it has changed the playing field. And with that, let's continue on with your show. Welcome back to the scene in the unseen. I'm chatting with uh, Tony Joseph about his book Early Indians and some really old times. Let's get a little more modern now. Let's come all the way to 7000 BC. And around 7000 BC is where uh, you talk about a place in Balochistan called Mehargarh. Why is Mehargarh significant? Well, Mehargarh is hugely significant because it changed earlier assumptions about uh, the Arabian civilization. About how it began, assumptions that Harappan civilization was just offshoot of the Mesopotamian civilization. Now we know that it is not so. It has a long history before the civilization began. Mehargarh is the first place where you can see the earliest beginnings of agriculture that sustained itself over a long period of time. There is another region called Lahore Deva in 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 Ganga Plain in UP today, where they have around seven thousand BC. Again, evidence of people. first indians experimenting with harvesting of uh, wild cereals if not cultivation of wild it, it could have grown into cultivation of cereals also but we don't have full evidence but in any case that did not develop into a full fledged rice based this were as rice that they were harvesting uh, agriculture in a- and would some of this have come about because the climate also was appropriate uh, to uh, sort of right, uh, right around the time after the glacial age ended around uh, 12000 years ago mm-hmm. and the climate started warming up you can see popular modern humans across the in many parts of the world were experimenting with various ways of uh, agriculture so it is not that it just began in one place and spread everywhere people in different parts of the world were experimenting with different things some wouldn't have succeeded some would have succeeded some would have succeeded for as long time and then disappear so so many things have to come in place for it to sustain itself for a very long period of time so we know that Mehargarh is one of those places starting from around 7000 BC we can see the there is a settlement and we can see that they are doing farming they are cultivating cereals uh, barley wheat we can see they are domesticating animals initially they don't have pottery and later on around 6000 BC they start having you can see how the initial pottery is it's put together with bitumen oh. you see so we can almost see the civilization starting up from uh earlier the the earliest phases they are depending on you know wild animals for example but as time goes on you can see it's the domesticated from the remains of their feasts that you can see it's their dependence on domesticated animals goes up dramatically so mehargar gives you a very good understanding of how a new way of living is dramatically different from the earlier hunter gatherer life took root in the indian subcontinent and spread across the entire northwestern region from over a period of time ultimately of course leading to the harappan civilization because without going through the phase of agriculture and the surplus that it produces you can't imagine a civilization rising and agricultural revolution in that part of indian subcontinent led to the harappan civilization that followed and you know obviously when we look back on history or prehistory there's always a benefit of hindsight everything seems inevitable but if you were to sort of 
uh, simulate the starting of an agricultural revolution you are going to eventually proceed in exactly the way history seems to have proceeded in this case because you would logically assume that because of agriculture you have a lot more surplus time for the people that finds expression firstly in cultural ways such as you point out through the beginning of pottery and also myth making narratives all of that stuff that happens later and it also finds expression in urbanization and that also takes a period of time but eventually you will expect to see cities develop you'll expect to see cultures develop myths and narratives develop language developed all of it kind of is completely logical and that's exactly how it works so it almost seems as if once you have the climate changing after the glacial age a mehargar is inevitable and from there eventually a harappan civilization is inevitable there are lots of important troubles there are lots of uh luck yeah. so to say that is needed for this to happen in that way for example okay. there has there is nothing that says the moment you take to agriculture that your productivity will be high enough right uh for you to have not everybody to have to work it farming and some people can be employed in you know uh, building mm. statues and other things and not everybody has to be working so productivity has to be high and there has to be enough food produced uh, by not the 100% of the population but only a smaller percentage of the population so that the rest of the people can do other things right so it is not always possible that you have such productivity for example you know in southeast asia there are people who have been farming taro and other tuber other around for a very long time but that does not lead to the kind of productivity that cereal gives so it's kind of the survivorship bias at play that these are the guys who did well and sort of expanded and became a civilization so now we can look back and draw these conclusions uh, no it depends on what kind of cereals you had for mm. example we know that wherever cereal cultivation and that i mean not always some exceptions also so what kind of things were possible for you to domesticate and cultivate in the region that you were in is a significant factor in saying how successful it came to be it is possible that the earliest rice varieties that we had were not productive enough and that it had to be hybridized with a newer variety which happened we now know from a recent research the intica variety got hybridized with the japonica variety of rice around 4000 roughly years ago in india and it's possible that led to a huge increase in productivity so some of these are developments that you can't foresee and uh, so that's why you did not have a rice based civilization possibly because it was not and you also need to for the civilization to take off initially it's not just agriculture you have to have an agricultural package of multiple crops along with a package of domesticated animals so all of these things you have to has to be available for you to be using them and it's not possible that all regions have it in some regions you may not find the exact solution to the problem but uh, yes but broadly it is correct once you have productivity happening and it is also important that there has to be institutions that can uh, take that uh, productivity and uh, use that productivity to direct labor to other activities productively which would also be a sign of the evolving culture i guess it is uh, yeah my book goes into in detail on how it happened in uruk mm, in the Mesopotamia. first city yeah. and the fascinating thing is that uh, it happened initially because there had to be i mean the book it's it's a long story but the interesting thing is that when the productivity starts going up uh what you see is not increasing prosperity not that people's homes start growing bigger or that uh, they have greater you can see they stay as they have always been but there is one thing whose size and opulence does increase as productivity increases and those are the temples the ziggurats and which shows you what was the institution that was coordinating the activities necessary to bring out higher productivity including building canals and having new ways and therefore who was appropriating a lot of the surplus while also providing some of the surplus into the building of new kinds of cities or organizations so you have some insight into how that the proceeds. elites with their false religions correct correct <laughs> <laughs> right so so that journey from mehargar to harappa is like 4400 years approximately as you say in your book 7000 bc to 2600 bc and we know the harappans lasted from about 2600 bc to uh, 
uh, 1900 BC. Tell me a little bit about Harappa. Yeah. I mean, what kind of a civilization was it? First thing, it was the largest civilization of its time, which we do not often realize. As big as Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations put together, both in terms of area and in terms of of the number of people, of of the population. Today, in terms of area, it would be about one third the size of India that that is today. Well, wow. and it had a fair degree of uh, standardization in its mature phase across a large number of things. The kind of seals it had, the kind of language that may have been used, because that, I mean that that still uh, my book talks about what the language could have been. The imagery on the seals that we talk about, the way the cities were built. So there are a lot of similarities and, and the size of the bricks, the weights that were used. So you can see lots of things that have been standardized across that large region. And mind you, this is before there is uh, modern communication, transport, any of these things. It's quite mind-boggling to think about how that was accomplished over in that period. And uh, one of the striking things about the Harappan civilization is that... Uh, you know in west especially when you consider it with the west asian civilization uh, the mesopotamian civilization with which we had always had strong uh, trade and other contacts we were always in contact but despite that the differences are so striking i mean in the harappan civilization there are no large statues of kings and you know there's nobody deified as kings of uh, we in did not imagery, know. no temples they, they, as well no temples as well Uh, so even the sculptures that we have from the Harappa, you would be surprised at how small they are. When you actually see them, that's not the image that you had. You thought they were much bigger. They're actually quite small. And another striking thing again, and uh, there are no images of human-on-human human violence except for one seal somewhere, which also which shows a woman being flanked on two sides with two men who are uh, with their spears, uh, you know. Uh, angle that each other which is multiple fascinating interpretations you mentioned <laughs> in your multiple book multiple fascinating interpretation so if we accept that seal there is no imagery of human on human violence there is human on animal violence human on super all kinds of things which is quite unlike other civilizations like in west asia where you can often see wars being uh, and conquests all being you know valorized and displayed in imagery we don't have royal burials which are full of you know some king has been buried along with huge amounts of treasures and things like we don't the our burials are very 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 not very surprising there are some personal uh, you know possessions or and that may include some jewelry also and some food for their after journey i suppose and uh, so that said which is stunning which is it is not that especially considering the fact that a lot of the jewelry in the mesopotamian civilizations were jewelry that were built or made in the harappan civilization and then sent there so it is not that we did not we knew we were actually making money from it we just didn't think it made sense for it to be buried the harappans were paniyas uh, <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in royal chambers so these are just some of the differences between the uniqueness of the civilization and just as there are no large temples or ostentatious uh, palaces and burials but you do see such investments going into public conveniences which you do not see in other in the uh, west asian civilizations for example the sewage system the roads the facilities for visitors to cities from water and you know so all of that my book describes in detail so there is lot more attention and money has spent on public conveniences than on uh, private uh, so it's that's our tradition and and it also fascinates me that at that point they must have evolved traditions of governance yes. uh, and so on which took a long long time to actually reemerge in the indian subcontinent so it's not just in terms of the scale of the cities and the city planning and the ambition of yeah. all of that that took a long time to reemerge but they very obviously could not have done this without evolved systems of governance and if you don't have big temples and gods and all that then then it, it's like a republic of men it seems so modern we can't today guess if you assume that the lack of symbols means temples were not the authority structures that got all these things together then who were it uh, yeah it's a surprising thing but there was an interesting point that was made by one of the historians which my book also talks about is that if you go to one of the palaces of the in, in uh, of the travancore royals 
it does not really look like a palace. It looks like an interesting house. So it's possible that we may not recognize a, a palace or a temple in the but that's unlikely i think which would also then if if that is the case be a cultural value that passed through the genes because the travancore royals would in a sense be descendants of the harappans <laughs> right <laughs> that's so, true. so that's tell true. me about the Har- harappans where did they come from like are they from west asia what is uh, what's the role of the early indians in this so to say who are till this point the original inhabitants what's going on here uh, my book calls the people who came the out of Africa migrants who arrived here around 65,000 years ago and their descendants as the first Indians. The Harappans are a mixture of first Indians and West Asians who arrived from roughly the Sagros region of, uh, of Iran around 9,000 years ago or earlier. And they mixed with the first Indians who may have already been experimenting with agriculture in places like Mehargarh for all you know. But this mixed population, it is clear that they catalyzed the agricultural transition across the entire region and then laid the foundation. So we now know the clear answer to who were the Harappans. The Harappans were a mixture of the first Indians and uh, West Asian agriculturalists who moved in here around uh, 9,000 years ago. And and population genetics absolutely establishes that now. Yes, this is uh, based on ancient DNA evidence which again talks in detail, which which look which shows that the Harappan civilization, this was the mixture of the Harappan civilization. And I understand this is the finding that is coming from the Rakigadi DNA, which is yet to be published as well. Right. And given that uh, the Harappan script has yet to be deciphered, um, though as you pointed out, you know, in this age of computers and AI and all, it's probably only a matter of time. But given that it's yet to be uh, deciphered what assumptions can we make about their language and the possible successors to that language what is really surprising is that uh, even before the harappan civilization forget about the new discoveries even before the harappan civilization was discovered anyone knew that there is such a thing as the harappan civilization there has been suggestions by linguists of links between dravidian languages and the language of the Elamite, which is a, today an extinct language, but which was spoken by in Elam, which is near in the Zagros region of Iran and uh, close to the Mesopotamian region. And that these two languages are much in common is an idea that predates the, the discovery of the Harappan civilization. Wow. And uh, But there's no way of you can prove it. It has always been papers written, these are the links, this is connected, this language is like, like this in, in these areas. Uh, now what we have found is that first the archaeological discoveries in Mehargar and the Jarij, who is the archaeologist who led the discoveries in, in his paper, which my book quotes, uh, talks about the similarities, the surprising similarities between Mehargar and regions of Zagros region in Iran, where also archaeologists had found early settlements. And the similarities are stunning in terms of the house designs. In terms of the first pottery that is that is made, you know, with bitumen and things like that. So there is a range of similarities between the two, which he, he surprised, he, he talks about in his, uh, in his empire. So archaeologically now, linguistically, there has always been a suggestion of a link. Archaeology has linked Mahargar with uh, Zagros region of Iran. And now genetics has gone further and said there is indeed migration of people from the Zagros region of Iran, roughly that, that region of West Asia, into India, and who mixed with the, with the first Indians to form the... So you have now evidence from multiple places of a links between these two regions. Now, what is the link? Is it possible? And as we know that the Indo-European languages arrived in India only much later, around uh, in, in the period between 4,000 to 3,000 years ago. So what is likely to happen in the language of the Harappans in that period? Uh, there are two, three things that one can possibly say. One is that this too large a region, it couldn't have been, even today in that region, there are many, many languages. So it couldn't have been one language, it must have been multiple languages. Yes, that's true. But it is possible that there was still one dominant language because there is uniformity in seals. Seals have writings and those writings are in, in a particular way. They don't change radically. If a script is used to, uh, uh, you know, used for one language and then used in another language, like the Harappan script has been used in, it is used in West Asia, for example, in trading and things like that. You can see the sequence of words changes because it's a different language. Now, across the sites of the Harappan sites, 
sequence is, is is consistent. So it suggests that there is at least for trading purposes, so at least for administrative purposes, there is some kind of language that is used as common. Now, what language that could be? It's a civilization that survived for 700 years and uh, and it has to have left a significant mark on the Indian culture. And the language that could fit the bill is the Dravidian languages, which are today spoken by about uh, 20% of the people of India, and uh, which is also linked to Brahui uh, language, which is today spoken by the Brahui in, in the northwestern parts of, which is in, today in Pakistan. So the idea that Elamite and Dravidian are linked has now been revived in the light of, uh, uh, comes back with much stronger force in the light of new discoveries of that link Elam to India. So the first time that uh, these suggestions were made, that there are similarities between the two languages, they were dealt with uh, skepticism for multiple reasons. One of the reasons being that uh, the earliest proto-Dravidian suggests not Harappan-like cities, but more like herding situations. But that's not surprising. If you assume that the earliest introduction of uh, of Dravidian languages, as we know, as we discussed earlier, the people who came from Zagros region to Harappa were not necessarily agriculturists, but were herders who were uh, who may have been exposed to the developing culture of agriculture in Mesopotamia, but were themselves nomadic herders. So, if that they came, some of them might have settled down to agriculture and then went on to create. But even now, there are nomadic Brahui themselves are nomads and pastoralists. So there are not all the people who came may have settled down to farming and then went on to create the Harappa. Some of them may have been pastoralists. And it is possible that it is pastoralists who brought Dravidian languages of Harappa down to South India first. The common assumption that the Harappan languages or Dravidian languages reached India after the Harappan civilization fell apart and they moved down south need not be the case. It is possible that it is this pastoralist who brought down and we have evidence from archaeo botany and other things of the of the of how the how the first agricultural package which includes both millets and pulses and a domesticated animal the domesticated animals was brought in into south india from the north so it is possible that it is this pastoralist who brought in brought it in into the south and that is the first uh, bringing of the Vedian languages into South India and it might have been pastoral at that time. So I'm saying many of the old questions that challenged the idea of a Dravidian language in Harappan may now have new answers based on new findings as well as uh, uh, possibilities like that that have now become evident. So before we get to the Aryan migration which happens after this, just to kind of uh, sum it up, um, some of the story of the link between Mehergar and Harappa all the way to South India. And and obviously, what we are now beginning to realize is that South Indians, in a sense, are the descendants of the Harappans. Where did they go? They came south. And the story really is that you have these pastoralist migrants from West Asia, from Zagros and so on, coming, perhaps settling in Mehergar where agriculture starts and that starts booming and there are various experiments and then you probably have a, like you said, luck being involved, a perfect storm of circumstances and from that cities evolve and um, productivity goes up, cities evolve, cultures evolve and so on and so forth and eventually of course the Harappan civilization uh, as we know lasted between 2600 and 1900 but even while it was on and perhaps after its decline uh, you have all of those guys coming down and settling in uh, South India and uh, there is evidence of that genetically of course it's uh, pretty much confirmed through archaeology and all that it's there and now you're saying that even linguistically there is coming to be this strong belief that the modern Dravidian languages like Tamil, Malayalam and so on originated from uh, there. Yeah, I would make as some when the Harappan civilization started declining people moved right? obviously and, and it was moved. already by then a mix of Zagrosian and That's early Indian as you're saying right and they've moved both, they're moving from northwestern India, right? So move east to what is today North India mm -hmm. and south to what is today South India. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the Harappans are ancestors to both North Indians and South Indians, both in a genetic sense and in a cultural sense because they carried with them many practices, beliefs, 
of the Harappan traditions with them to both these regions. The only difference is that they would have brought their languages also to both these regions, North India as well as South India. But a later migrations of Indo-European language speaking people from uh, Central Asia overlay or displaced. There was a language shift that happened in North India from uh, Dravidian languages to, to Indo-European languages. That shift did not happen in South India where the language still continues. So the difference between North India and South India is that in, as regards to Harappan is that the, the linguistic heritage of Harappa is with the South Indians but the cultural and genetic heritage of the Harappans are both in the South and in the North. In a sense, the Harappans are in many ways the glue that holds us together in, because the, it has left such an imprint on the cultural practices today because if you build houses around courtyards today, it's, that's the way houses were built in the Harappan tradition. So many, many factors that you today take for granted, we may not realize that they actually come from the imprints that have been left behind by the Harappan civilization. If many of the things that we today see as continuities between different parts of the region could owe their beginnings to what people did in the Harappan civilization. In fact, as you pointed out, even Sanskrit and even some of what we know as a Vedic culture has imprints of Harappan civilization Absolutely. in it. You've detailed some of it in your uh, book. Let's talk about the Aryan migrations now. It is clear that, I mean, there is this term called Indo-Proto-European and you kind of know that there is a much commonality between, for example, uh, the uh, that set of languages which come from Sanskrit and uh, uh, the European languages. And until recently, there were sort of two schools of thought and there were people who uh, would say that, hey, the migration could have happened in any direction. It isn't necessary that they came here. Or maybe it originated here and we went there. But as you point out in your book, um, the new signs has decided that question decisively. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. The new science is ancient DNA, but before ancient DNA, <laughs> there's a simple way to answer it, right? Indo-European languages, the family of languages, has spread from Iceland <laughs> to India. India forms the easternmost area in which uh, Indo-European languages are spoken. There's no community of people uh, towards the east of India that speaks Indo-European languages. So how did the language come to be uh, spread as it is. For India as well as for any other region, the only answer is either somebody else brought it in there or it went from this region to the rest of the world. Those are the only two answers. Now, if it went from India to the rest of the world, there should be a signal of that uh, movement genetically, meaning you should be able to see. Remember, for, you are talking about even today, we know that first Indian, the ancestry of in, all Indians, almost all populations carry 50 to 65% of first Indian ancestry. No matter where in the caste hierarchy you are, no matter what language you speak, no matter which region you inhabit, you are likely, if, if, if this applies to most Indian population groups, you, are, you carry between 50 to 65 percent. And much more in the case of the Andaman uh, residents, yes. who, as you pointed out, yes. are probably the less uh, purest mixed. descendants of yeah. the... So that is the ancestry of the uh, first Indians. So if there was indeed a large migration that took these languages from India to the rest of the world, you should see a trail of first Indian ancestry going from India uh, to the rest of the world. In the genome. But in the genome, yeah. But we know that first Indians are by and large, they don't have close relatives anywhere else in the world. Because the people who went, their descendants who went on to populate the rest of the world, you know, 65,000 years, so that happened so long ago that they are no longer close relatives because they, they spread apart so long ago. So today, if you ask any geneticist, he would say first Indians' uh, ancestry is, is South Asian and it doesn't have to have close relatives outside. Now, there is an exception to this rule that proves the case. The exception is that of a community called Roma, who were earlier called gypsies. Everybody knows that the Roma came from India around 1,500 years ago. They spread from India with northwestern India and then spread out. And there are millions of them today in Europe as well as in the uh, in the Americas. So if you, and the recent studies that have been done on the DNA of the Roma shows that their mtDNA or mitochondrial DNA suggests that they do. The signal of the first Indian is their haplogroup called M2, which is the most common haplogroup among in, in India today. And that signal is there. 
but this is an exception they couldn't have spread uh into european languages to the rest of the world because that that happened only in, in 1500 years ago roughly in historical times not prehistorical time. so this is this is a strong ex- instance one strong reason to say that out of india is untenable uh, the theory that indo european languages went from out of india to the rest of the world is untenable because there is no evidence to support it the second factor is that out of india has always in recent times has been an angry retort to suggestions of this is how indo european languages spread but it has never been fleshed out into a sing- there is not a single paper that says this is how it happened this is the period when it happened this is the roots that they took and this is how they spread across the rest of the world there is no scientific paper that lays out the case for out of india it is always been a single retort rhetorical answer to the idea that this is how the indo european languages spread across the world now what has happened in recent times is that uh, there has ancient dna has proved there is significant movement of people from central asian steppe into europe around 5000 years ago and into south asia around 1000 years later around 4000 years ago between 4000 and 3000 years ago and this is uh, what carried indo european languages into both regions how do we know this today for i mean there are multiple answers to this from the different disciplines from the different disciplines between archaeological similarities and the and the spread of the languages themselves and to the fact that today when you look at uh, step ancestry among indians you will see that it is much higher is elevated levels as one of the studies puts it recent studies the uh, step ancestry is elevated in those uh, groups of people who have been traditional custodians of uh, sanskrit texts so i think there is a multiplicity of uh, evidence with suggesting the link between the spread of migrations into both europe and into south asia and the languages that they carried that's a perfect fit for the kind of distribution of this family that we see across the world so uh, continue the story for me we we have harappa between 2600 and 1900 and then there is a decline i mean firstly what what are the possible causes of the decline and what happens after that and uh, secondly you have the aryan migration coming in um, sort of from the top and how is all of that playing out um you know there was an earlier assumption that uh, the earliest version of nobody uses nobody has used the aryan invasion theory for at least many many decades is a straw man which has been put up by those who do not like to no. uh, accept the idea that there has been migration but when there was aryan invasion theory was spoken about in the very early you know during when the harappan civilization was discovered because then the assumption was that what caused the decline was the arrival of the uh, when i was Aryans. in school i was distinctly i remember i was taught the aryan invasion theory as invasion yeah so this was when they came about that they destroyed civilization and that was the earliest uh, that uh, cause of the civilization uh, decline of the civilization but this is this uh, statement made by the head of the indian archaeological survey then a britisher who said indra stands accused <laughs> he himself withdrew that statement later saying that that's not the evidence because f- for different reasons for reasons such that the dating of the vedas were much later so they couldn't have come around the time when so for a variety of reasons but the person who made the accusation himself retracted it and there has been no archaeological evidence to support that the sites of the harappan civilization were uh, destroyed by invading armies and for many years now and the evidence has been accumulating that it's a long drought that caused the decline of not just harappan civilization but many other civilizations around the same time to the extent that the there is now a new age is being defined my book talks about it is called the meghalayan age meghalayan age because the proof for this long drought was discovered from you know from geological formations in meghalaya but it is being called a meghalayan age to describe this new period that began with a long drought so it's not clear that it is climatic factors that were the major factor Uh, major cause of the decline of the harappan civilization though other things as as is always the case other things might have added to it later on including migrations as possible so yeah and, and then you know once the aryan comes as also besides the genetic interminglings as cultural interminglings 
लाइक यू पॉइंटेड आउट यू नो अलॉट ऑफ हरपन कल्चर इज रिफ्लेक्टेड इन वॉट वी कॉल वेदिक कल्चर एंड एज्यूम टू बी यू नो समथिंग प्योर डेट ओरिजिनेटेड आउट ऑफ इट्स जेनरी एज इट वट there are influences of harappa there there are influences of uh, harappa on the language sanskrit itself yes the earliest versions of sanskrit that we have has already has uh, what is called retroflex consonants in it like ta na these are consonants these are sounds that you have to make by curling your tongue and no. striking your palate no and this is retroflex consonants are not there in other indo european language families not even in persian which is the no. closest that you can find but it is there in sanskrit in the earliest sanskrit so how why is it there it is there because retroflex consonants have been a common factor across many earlier south asian languages including dravidian so it's clearly a sign of the influence on the earliest uh, sanskrit that we have that the, it has retroflex consonants that other indo european languages mostly do not have there might be one or two exceptions but by and large they don't have and the striking thing is even persian doesn't have and if you look at uh, and my book says that uh, there is a disconnect between the harappan civilization and what its concerns and images were and the earliest texts vedic texts uh, such as the rigveda and over time you can see that that disconnect disappears such as give me give me some example uh, for example take the case of the rigveda speaks poorly of phallus worshippers shishna deva right and they do, it doesn't want sh- those people to be associated or come anywhere near lord indra and uh, they really dislike them but there is evidence uh, archaeologists have excavated places like tholavira rs bisht for example talks about how there is significant evidence of uh, phallus worship not just in tholavira but in other harappan cities as well so that's a disconnect this connect between what the rigveda says and what you can see as the practice in the harappan civilization but that disconnect goes later because that's not a the objection to phallus worship is not something that sustains that goes away uh you can see in the harappan civilization you can see many images or even one seal which is so strikingly similar to a yogic position we don't know whether it was a yogic position but you can't deny the fact that it is it it, it, it this, this sounds very familiar to you and not only the seal there are also many other small artifacts which remind you of yoga or yogic things but in the earliest parts of the vedic text there's no mention of the yoga but by the time you come to the later parts later compositions you can see clear evidence of it so there are multiple levels at which you can see like it happens everywhere you can see that there is an intermingling of cultures there's adoption there's adaptation both happening as the newcomers mingle with the already existing settled populations of the harappans in the areas so you have to see the indian culture has draws from multiple it's not it doesn't come from a single source as we have often imagined it's a, it's it comes from multiple sources it has put together just as genetically we are a combination of four major prehistoric migrations that happened uh, there are other migrations too but nothing left us big and imprint us these four migrations which are these four just to the out of africa am i agree so we talked about the indians the, the west asians that we mm. talked about there's a third one which we haven't talked about which mm. is there's a migration from east asia that happened right around 4000 to 3500 years ago which brought austro asiatic languages such as khasi mundari etc which are spoken by tribals in central india and eastern india india actually has four major large language families of course indo european which is spoken by three fourths of the people dravidian languages austro asiatic languages and uh, tibeto burman languages this is not including the andamanese languages which are a separate one there are also one or two isolates so of this the four indo european dravidian indo european we spoke about dravidian we spoke about austro asiatic is is came from east asia tibeto burman obviously is a part of the language family that also came as part of migration but it's a very small population in uh, smaller than even the austro asiatic and what was fascinating and very apt to me and even moving is is your uh, use of the pizza analogy yeah. where you describe sort of uh, india as you know to think of it as a pizza just can you expand on that yeah it came uh, quite accidentally when a fr- i mean uh, when a friend of mine who 
knew what I was writing on, wanted to know how I would uh, describe his state's population as a mixture of what and what. So it was in the context of trying to explain it to him that the Bitsa analogy came to me that, uh, uh, but when I thought about it, I thought, you know, this is just a, this doesn't sound like a good one. I am sure I'll be able to find a better met- metaphor later on. But as it stands, I have never been able to find a metaphor. It's a fantastic metaphor. How would you find something <laughs> better? So just expand on it. <laughs> so the, the base of the Bisa is the, are the first Indians or the first Indian ancestry that forms 50 to 65 percent of the ancestry of most Indian population that groups. That came 65,000 years ago from That came 65,000 years ago. And this is a striking, which we did not know earlier. In fact, we used to ask out of Africa migrants, where did they go? Uh, they are it us. is true, of course, that uh, you can see it in, them in uh, in the Andaman Islands, uh, who did not mix with people as all of us did. But the first answer to the question is: Look in the mirror. Fifty to sixty-five percent of the ancestry of most Indian population groups first comes from the first Indians. So that's the base. That's the foundation. It also shows that how wrong it is for anyone to think, as we often think, that the tribals, for example, are somehow very different. And uh, from the rest of the population, not true. If we share, if the rest of the population shares most with anyone else, that's with the tribals. The tribals are us. Uh, us in inverted commas. Yeah. But uh, the point is, that's the, so, so this, it's the wrong impression. So the first Indians are the foundation, are the base of the Indian pizza. That's what is unique about us because there's nothing else like this anywhere else in the world. So if you want to say, what's unique, what makes us anyone else look at Indians and say he is an Indian. I mean, Indian I use in the entire South Asian context. This is the base that makes it who is an Indian. So, I mean, base, not, I mean, I'm exaggerated. It's, it's all of the rest. So, on the foundation is laid the, the sauce. And what's the sauce? The sauce is the Harappans. How come? The, because the Harappans, when the civilization declined, they spread across, across the pizza, both North India and South India. They are the ancestors of both. And uh, so that's the sauce that has spread all over the pizza. And then there is the cheese, the idea. And uh, they're not spread uniformly. They're spread more in the north, less in the south. But uh, they are there everywhere. So that's the, uh, that's the cheese, you could say. Then there are the toppings, which is both the Austro-Asiatic and the tibeto burman and all the others who came later, who may not have left a large imprint on our demography, but are still makes the pizza what it is, you, it will taste very differently if those toppings were not there. So, so that's the Indian population. And, as it is. And, and you know, the other uh, large and w- very welcome and gratifying conclusion of all of this science is that there is no such thing as races or racial purity or any of that. All of that is just conceptual nonsense because we are all completely mixed. Absolutely. Conceptual nonsense born out of a need to uh, people have an innate need to create identities and they need uh, you know classifications and things to create those identities that will set them apart from other identities but the reality is that the more you closely look at them so they are not black and white stories all populations are combinations you cannot find a population that is not a combination unless you suddenly find that hey there is this population in amazon forest somewhere who hasn't been in touch with anybody for 50000 years well, it can't be 50,000 in the Amazon. It has to be less than 16,000. So that's impossible. So I'm saying somewhere you find that there is an out-of-Africa population that hasn't mixed with anyone forever. And then you can say, yeah, then there might be very different. There must be a pure race. But other than that, all populations are mixes multiple times. And one of the amazing things that is now clear is that one of the strong objections of people when you say Indian Indians is a result of four major population migrations is because they think that's why are you taking, picking out India and, you know, why are you portraying India as some peculiar case where there is multiple migration? This is not true. This is true of all parts of the world. Right. This is true of all parts of the world. Europe has seen its populations. In fact, we have been less affected by migrations uh, than other parts of the world because not, in most of the parts of the world in Europe, for example, the first hunter-gatherer ancestry is in single digits. Why? Because there have been there have been at least two major migrations that completely changed the demography of Europe. So you'd say that their pizza doesn't really have a base per se. In new base sense. because new, yeah. <laughs> okay. new migrants, the old base is gone. Right. 
or reduced to single digits, except mm-hmm. in North Europe, where there is a much larger percentage of their, uh, Northern Europe has a much larger percentage of, of their hunter-gatherers. So Europe has seen at least two major migrations. First around 9,000 years ago, from West Asia again, not from the same region as Zagros, but from Anatolia, that went into taking farming into Europe. And then around 5,000 years ago, the same guys, or close to the same guys who came here, who went into Europe, taking Indo-European languages, horse riding, chariot driving, masters of metallurgy, the new, the step pastoralists who went and uh, either mixed with the existing Neolithic farmers in Europe to some extent and replaced them to a large extent. That's the story of Europe. America, we know that even before the Europeans came in, European story is a different one. Even before the Europeans came in, there were at least three major migrations from Asia that populated uh, the Americas as they are. In East Asia, we know that there are at least two major migrations that change the entire demography of East Asia. One of those bringing is what brought in Austroasiatic languages to India. The other one brought Austronesian languages to many parts of the Pacific Islands. So, repeated mass migrations that change demography is not specific. It's not a speciality of South Asia. In fact, it is, uh, it is, it is true of most regions in the world. In Central Asia, for example, it would be difficult to keep track of uh, the number of times the migrations and uh, have changed the demography of the region. So, Possibly the most fascinating chapter in your book for me was actually the epilogue, where you sort of uh, move on from the science and you look at uh, some of the really new findings and you raise questions with them, which you don't necessarily want to answer or uh, go out of your way to answer, but it's important that, you, um, uh, that those questions are being raised. And one of those questions is about caste where, like you point out, the new science shows that the caste system really solidified around 100 CE. That's right. And as you say, it, it is not at all inevitable in a cultural sense that it was going to turn out that way because within Hinduism, there were other competing traditions like uh, Charvakas or Lokayuktas, which were uh, much more based on rationalism and not so hierarchical and all that. But nevertheless, the caste system came about. So what's the kind of evidence through which we know this that it became so endogamous and what are the consequences of this? Yeah, as you said, the new information that we have now, which we did not have earlier, I mean, before two years ago, is that endogamy, which is a distinguishing mark of the caste system of people marrying within their community, did not begin until about 100 CE. And that between... Genetics also says this, between around 4,000 years ago and the beginning of the Common Era, that's almost for 2,000 years, right? 2,000 BCE to 100 CE, or around 2,000 years, there was significant mixing between different population groups. That's also a finding in the country of the kind that has never been seen before or later. Just imagine all that happened. So if, if you were to ask yourself, what is the most tumultuous period? in the history of of our of this region, there should be no doubt about what that period was. It is around 2000 BCE to 100 CE. Why is that? Think of all that happened. A long existing civilization that had thrived in its mature form alone for 700 years the went away. The Harappan civilization slowly, but definitively went away. A new migrants came from East Asia, bringing a new set of languages and perhaps new farming practices. Another set of migrants came from Central Asia, bringing warlike, bringing into new languages uh, who are dominant and there's a language shift that happens in Northern India. And uh, in this midst, there is a major mixing between different population groups that is going on that is unheard of any at any point of time. Because you have to remember that by 4,000 years ago, all the four major population groups that would form the foundation, that would form the Indian demographic piece. So they are all in. And for 2,000 years, there's significant mixing that leaves no one untouched. Today, if you take the most remote tribal population, you would still find that he carries the ancestry of multiple populations. So that's the extent to which the mixing happened. Because 2,000 years is a very long time. We were the party capital of the world. (laughs) Yeah. The only people who escaped it were the Andamanese, 
because they are actually physically cut off from the rest of the mainland and they don't know what is going on there. But this suddenly comes to an end around not suddenly it may have happened over a period of time and um, but around 100 CE it comes to an end and this is counterintuitive, right? Because you can easily imagine uh, people who are you know so far decided to stay separately is deciding one day hey this is silly let's let's just start mixing but it's far more difficult to imagine people who have been freely mixing for th- 2000 years almost and then suddenly decided hey this doesn't make sense let's let's stop uh, let's stop mixing i mean the horse has already bolted right so what is this about when you think it like that you realize that and and you also realize that this takes away the suggestion that the caste system began with the arrival of the ideas, right? It doesn't begin. There's almost a 2,000 year difference. Then you realize that this is more a political development than a religious development, though with the caveat that it's often difficult to distinguish politics from religion. Even today. But <laughs> even today. But it suggests that it's a polit- caste is a political development more than a religious development. And it has doesn't have enough genetic reasoning behind it because we are already have. That's why Ambedkar is right when he says there is no difference between the, the Dalits and the others because yes, there we, are, we are a mixed population. So what caused this new political ideology to come into the front in around 100 CE? Uh, we do not have clear answers. So my book only says these are ways to we need to far more research to answer these questions. But we have some initial things to go by. And one of the things is, is what you can see in the text as a tension between Aryavarta and Malaysia Desha or, or things that are not part of Aryavarta. And mind you, both these regions are, in, are inhabited by the Arya or people who call themselves Arya and are Indo-European language speaking people. Still, the people of a particular region who call themselves Aryavarta find people of the other region who are Arya and who are Indo-European language speaking, not kosher, not, not really part of uh, Aryavarta. Why is that? The best argument that we can, possible reason that we can find is that there are differences of social attitudes and conservatism and ideas about social mixing between different parts of the idea who came into India, that they were not all of the same mind. We already know this to some extent because our texts themselves talk about multiple groups and conflicts between groups. So it is wrong to think of one monolithic group of people with the same ideas and same approach uh, to life in general and to how societies should be structured coming into the country. There were multiple groups, they had multiple beliefs and ways of approach, some were more conservative, some were, to use current terminology, uh, more liberal. Uh, And it is likely that the more conservative approach to social life was dominant in what is called Aryavarta, which is in the confluence in the area between the Ganga uh, and the Yamuna. And the areas outside of that confluence are uh, regarded as Malaysia Desha by who asked this question, which is the land of the Aryavarta, Aryas, and defines it in this way. So the area outside of the confluence of the Ganga and Yamuna, which would include parts of what would later come to be known as Magadha, is actually where the next is the center of the second urbanization that happens. It's a place where the new religions arise, Buddhism and and Jainism, which do not accept many rituals and practices of, of the earlier religion. And it's also where the next empire comes from. So if you assume that there is a, tension between these two regions by around 100 CE you have to you have the only conclusion that you can arrive at is that this tension was resolved in one way with the victory of one victory meaning one opinion or of how the society should be structured and organized gaining over the other side on how it should be the dominance of that one cultural strand and the and the uh, you know this continued almost enforced endogamy in a sense has interesting consequences. I want to quote this passage from uh, David Reich's uh, book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, uh, which, um, uh, you know, you've quoted in your book, and and that's also a great book. Um, Quote, People tend to think India, with its more than 1.3 billion people, is having a tremendously large population. And indeed, many Indians as well as foreigners see it this way. 
but genetically this is an incorrect way to view the situation the han chinese are truly a large population they have been mixing freely for thousands of years in contrast there are few if any indian groups that are demographically very large and the degree of genetic differentiation between indian jati groups living side by side in the same village is typically two or three times higher than the genetic differentiation between northern and southern europeans the truth is that india is composed of a large number of small populations stop go and this is in a sense very disturbing just as a picture of where we are today because this is not just true in a genetic sense a large number of small populations yes and this is the result of of the last 2000 years we have a history that is much larger and uh, as i put it yeah it is disheartening to read that and but uh, the way i see it is that uh, we have to realize that this was not uh, inevitable this was not the way we were going even after all of the elements of the indian population groups were in this was not the way we were going so what happened around 100 ce has to be seen as something as a as a political development and if it is a political development that happened around then it, it is it can be pushed back and can be seen to be different when you say push back i'm not talking about laws and things like that that has already done been done but culturally but i'm saying our basic understanding why does it survive because our basic understanding of how this population how we are put together hasn't changed and that's what i hope this book will change that our basic understanding of what who we are has to change for this miss for this reality to change also that uh, endogamy has caused us and the cost is much to one of the cause we already know because we talk about it because a division like this prevents people from reaching to the heights of their competence and to to how far they can go because if you are saying birth determines to a large extent where you can go we are saying uh, no to a lot of i mean the human cost not, is incalculable yeah. i mean there's no question yeah the second part is equally important which may may we not realize all the time is that it's important for people any community especially in a, in a locality society is progress and progress fast when they take common action to the benefit of everybody but if the structures are even within villages are such that it is difficult to take common action that would benefit everybody because there are so many divisions then that's a whole lot of positive things that we are saying no to and uh, so the cost of this we have to realize only then will i think we will get to reversing this in a significant way it's distressing to see how often how endogamy is still a practice if you, you know various research that is done in marriage practices and things like that still shows that it's a very dominant trend and it's not changing it's embedded in our culture now no matter what the laws might say uh, speaking of you know current modern politics why do these sort you know why do these new, uh, new findings get so much push back like even you have been told so often on twitter for example uh, for these uh, uh, you know why does it matter why do people in politics have a stake on whether the aryans came this way or that way who was there first what is the original indian culture what is the role of the vedas why does all of this matter i mean i i imagine that look we are in the 21st century and it should not matter all of this is just of academic interest but no but these are like life political questions why that's right i think uh, it's also interesting to note that i know i consistently talk about four large migrations and nobody has any problems with three of them <laughs> <laughs> uh there's nobody raises an objection to saying no we did not come from out of africa we did not there, nobody says no there was no Uh, Tamil is not related to Elam. Elam, we, we we came from here. There's nobody saying any objection to any of the th- first three migrations. The only objection is to only one of them, the Arya migration. And the reason I think it's born out of a misunderstanding that our civilization is single source, and it is from is the Arya, the Vedas, the Sanskrit. And if you say that came from, that was the result of a migration, then you're saying all of our culture is. is important that's wrong because the what the book argues is that the our civilization is a mixture of multiple influences the harappan civilization is as much is an earlier source is the first source if you can say or at least an earlier source of indian civilization which has left a large imprint on our culture the arya sanskrit vedic tradition is a very important constituent 
of the Indian civilization, but it is not the earliest or the only one. So you do not need to be horrified if you say, like other migrations, the Arya also came as migrants about 4,000 to 3,000 years ago. The second factor is that there is an assumption that if you say they brought into European languages, then you are saying the Vedas and the Sanskrit, you know, all came from, uh, imported in flat pack, you know, and then recombined uh, after opening the package. That's not true. The Sanskrit and the Vedas, almost all of it is the result of interaction with people who are already settled here. And that's not something that is foreign. That is very much, that's how all of our things are. It is a mixture of different traditions, different ancestries, different stories. So these two things have to be, uh, these fears have to be taken out of the picture. But that's only, only part of the problem. The part, other part of the problem is not out of these fears. But as the British historian E.J. Hobsbawm said, the historian is to nationalists but the opium makers or, or poppy growers are to heroin addicts. They provide the raw material that the market needs. The market for nationalism needs an idea of, uh, of identity creation, requires myths about who we are and what we are. And there are myths uh, that are more uh, appealing for political purposes and there are myths that are not that appealing to political purposes or reality that is not appealing to political purposes. So I think what this book tries to do is that until now, we did not have solid scientific data and evidence to give clear answers to our prehistory, which is essentially where the fundamental questions about the formation of our population lie. Now we have. So I hope that discussions about uh, our population formation and therefore everything else that follows will begin to be based on actual scientific data and uh, findings rather than myths, fancies and uh, caricatures of reality. I, I find it bizarre that there are some nationalistic narratives that are so simplistic that they place value judgments on what came earlier or what originated here or what came from outside. I mean, it doesn't matter. We are all from Africa and we are all basically a khichri and, and uh, your book in that sense by uh, summing up the dramatic advances that science has made in the last six years uh, both gave me a lot of joy and a lot of hope. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Tony. It, it, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. I really liked this conversation. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, take my word for it, the book is far deeper and more insightful. So head on over to your nearest bookstore online or offline and pick up a copy of Early Indians. It's published by Juggernaut, so you can also read it on the Juggernaut app. They have some funky annual deal I've taken where you pay some small annual amount and can then read all the books on their app. So consider that. And if you want to follow Tony on Twitter, his handle is at tjoseph0010, at tjoseph0010. You can follow me at Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. And you can browse past episodes of The Seen and the Unseen on seenunseen.in and thinkpragati.com. Thank you for listening. How aware do you think you are of your laws and rights? Do you look up to laws when you are caught up in situations? Do you know what your rights are when you are stuck somewhere bad? Well, here's a show that can help you move an inch closer to being aware of what your rights are. Tune in to Know Your Kanoon with me, Amar Rana. This is a podcast meant to answer all your law-related queries. Catch Know Your Kanoon every week on the IVM website or the app or anywhere you get your podcast from. Sachin Tendulkar, Virat Kohli, Don Bradman, and now Cyrus Brocha. Okay, probably not in the right company. I mean, Don Bradman is Australian. But it's called Cyrus Says, a wonderful show about everything. Find the show on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts.